Right. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Steven Pinker and Rabbi David Wolby with us this evening. Steven Pinker is an experimental cognitive psychologist and a popular writer on language, mind, and human nature. His research on vision, language, and social relations has won prizes from the National Academy of Sciences and numerous other organizations. He's the author of many books, including The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, and Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. He has been named Humanist of the Year, Farm Policy's 100 Global Thinkers on that list, and Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World Today. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. You may also remember Stephen was a guest of ours, I think on our very second program right after coronavirus began, and that kind of launched this program, which is now three and a half years old. We also have with us Rabbi David Wolpe, uh, who graduated from the same high school that I did, Akiba Hebrew Academy, just outside of Philadelphia. He is a visiting scholar here at Harvard Divinity School, the inaugural rabbinic fellow at the ADL, and the Max Webb Rabbi Emeritus of Sinai Temple. Named the most influential rabbi in America by Newsweek and one of 50 most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post, Rabbi Wolpe has written eight books, including Why Be Jewish, Making Loss Matter, Creating Meaning in Difficult Times, and Why Faith Matters. He's also authored weekly columns at the Jewish Week and the Jerusalem Post. Almost exactly 15 years ago, a Harvard Crimson article began Rabbi David J. Wolpe and psychology professor Stephen Pinker debated the existence of God and the benefits of faith at Harvard Hillel last night, just in this room. We're pleased to welcome these two guests as they return to center stage here at Harvard Hillel. While over the past two months, the media has been dominated by the war in Israel, when I visited Israel just before the war began, the country was in the midst of another crisis. The debates over judicial reform were only part of a deeper divide plaguing the country. Much of the internal strife within Israeli society stems from an inability to have civil dialogue across ideological divides. This reached a crescendo on the final moments of Yom Kippur. An Orthodox group wished to have a public Ne'ilah service in Dissingoff Square in um, Tel Aviv. And defying a court order to separate, that pre prevented them from separating men and women using a mechitza, participants strung up Israeli flags to separate men from women. Protesters then pulled down the flags and removed the chairs that organizers had set up, and in short, all hell broke loose, with people shouting and cursing at one another, calling each other vile names, all this in the final moments of the Yom Kippur. One article describing the event included this paragraph, and this was before October 7th. Quote, leaders from across Israel's political spectrum have cautioned about the rise of the, state, the same gratuitous hatred that was blamed for the end of the Jewish people's first two sovereign political entities in biblical times. Ever since the war with Hamas broke out, I have been haunted by those words. While our attention is rightfully focused on rising anti-Semitism on campus and across the globe and on the welfare of those who remain hostage and the war in Israel, I personally have also felt a renewed sense of Harvard Hillel's mission and have been looking forward to tonight's program for quite some time. Hillel has long been an institution that seeks to build a truly pluralistic community, one in which its diverse members are, not, are able not only to coexist and to find common ground on which to unite, but one in which we are able to learn to engage substantively across difference. Those, st those skills are crucial at any scale, whether in a community of college students or on a national level in Israel. We must learn to cultivate those skills. My favorite line from that Crimson article 15 years ago was, quote, despite the spirited debate, the, dis the discussion remained, remained congenial. I hope and expect that our guests this evening 
who come question. from very different places will disagree with each other. And I hope that they will serve as a model for all of us of how to engage respectfully with those with whom we disagree. Without further ado, Stephen Pinker and David Wolfe. So, so we agreed I get the opening toss. Um, and I want to begin actually by going back to that night 15 years ago for the following reason. About, I don't know, 10 years ago, eight years ago, I was asked to give an opening blessing at the 90th birthday of Carl Reiner. Those of you who are older will remember Carl Reiner. He was a comedy writer. He was a comedian with Mel Brooks. He was well known in his day. He had his 90th birthday party. Rob Reiner is his son. Um, anyway, I got up to give a blessing and I started saying whatever I was saying. And somebody called out from the audience, why is there a rabbi? Reiner's an atheist. And he jumped up on stage, which at 90 is no mean feat. He put his arm around me. He said, I am not an atheist. I'm a Jewish atheist. And that's different. <laughs> and, and I used to tell people that I had debates with a, with a variety, with, with Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and so on. The only debate where someone said, and now representing the party, no God, a good friend of the Hillel, Steven Pinker, was the Jewish atheist, because nobody else would call themselves the good friend of a religious organization if they were an atheist, unless they were Jewish. And there is a sort of different approach of Jews who are atheists, that is, it doesn't have the drop of poison or resentment quite the same way. And so I first want to ask you, before I really ask you the question that I want to get to about October 7th, did you, did you feel like when you were often lumped with all the other atheists when that was fashionable, did you feel different in terms of your approach? Uh, I, I did, and uh, I think although Sam Harris uh, among the new atheists is also Jewish. Jewish. And Christopher Hitchens found out he was, so that's though true. he didn't know. Uh, but it, I think it is true that there is less tension uh, in being a Jewish atheist than being, say, a Catholic atheist. I don't know if those two words have ever been uttered uh, mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Uh, and that's this is something that I learned from uh, the other atheist, Jewish atheist in the family, Rebecca Goldstein, my other mm -hmm. half, who uh, actually wrote it, the great Jewish atheist novel, 36 Arguments mm -hmm. for the Existence of God, yep. a work of fiction. Um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, for one thing, Judaism isn't so much a, um, a religion of belief as it is a religion of practice. And this came clear to me when I uh, arrived at graduate school and my roommate was Catholic, and I asked him about his uh, opinions on, on abortion. And he was kind of taken aback, and he said, well, you know, I, I'm a Catholic. I, I, I don't get to have my own uh, right to an opinion on abortion. If the church is against it, that's all there is to it. This is, I hate to say it, so goyish <laughs> that your religion would tell you what to believe. Uh, and I am in, uh, you know, I suppose uh, there's a way in which I could be lumped with, with you know, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and uh, 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 Dan Dennett. But I also affiliate with some of the great Harvard Jewish atheists, but, um, I, uh, which I include Alan Dershowitz and Daniel Bell, the great sociologist. And uh, Daniel tells a story that when he was 13, he uh, said to his rabbis that I've been um, agonizing over this, and I've searched my soul, and I just have to say I've come to the conclusion that I just don't think that God exists. And the rabbi said, you think God cares? <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll mention one other uh, anecdote is when, when Rebecca spoke at a Jewish community center in the Bay Area, uh, a rabbi came up to her afterwards and said, you know, there's nothing in Judaism that says you have to believe in God. You just can't believe in more than one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, it's a wonderful novel, I have to say. Even though it, in the back it has all these arguments for why God, why the arguments for God are no good, the novel is good. Just ignore the back stuff. Just um, I said, by the way, the climax of the novel is a debate. Uh, resolved, God exists, sponsored by the Harvard agnostic chaplaincy <laughs> for people who just can't make up their minds. Uh, but it was not based on my yeah. uh, dialogue with, uh, with David that 15 years ago. So here, this is where I'd like to start the discussion. Um, 
I can't help it. I, I have a hopeful temperament, right? I mean, I, I just the other day I said to somebody, like, my character is like when you dive into the Dead Sea, I always come to the top. I like can't stay down, even though I try. But I have been smart enough not to write a book that argues that things are getting better. Because if you do that, then every time something bad happens, somebody says, hey, I thought you told us things were getting better. My, uh, I don't know, are you my antagonist tonight? Is that, what's the right word? Um, the better half of the debate actually wrote books that argue that on the whole, for human beings, things are getting better. And so I want to ask you, when horrible things occur, do you see that as an isolated anecdotal thing? Does it in any way make you rethink the trajectory of humanity when you see how barbaric human beings can still be? Well, there, there's kind of two elements to what I've written about. In, in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, and Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. So one of them is just plotting data on uh, long-term trends that most people are not aware of, um, and presenting the surprise to most people, including myself, that many of them show spectacular improvements. Uh, most obviously, we live longer. We not only uh, have extra life, but we have an extra life. Life expectancy at birth now across the world is double what it was historically. Uh, that is, it's more than 70 years, a biblical three score and 10. In most societies, it, for most of history, it was 30. In developed countries, it's more than 80. So we can do this every 15 years. We, for, uh, yeah, every 15 years, we'll be having this debate at Hillel for the next, like, four or five, 50 increments. We'll see if the, you know, right. if we, uh, if the lifespan keep, keeps increasing. But... Um, and perhaps to most people's surprise, deaths in war uh, have been, uh, well, I'll talk about the time when I wrote the book, were, were um, in, in sharp decline. Now, not linear and not even monotonic, that is, always going down, never going up. There are There is something of a roller coaster. There are regressions. But the overall trajectory was is downward. Um, now, that presenting those data, uh, is, people often... Uh, characterize me as an optimist because I say the rate of death in war has gone way down. I, mean, I never considered it an optimist. I just consider it to be uh, data that you would not appreciate if you get your view of the world from the news because the news is a non-random sample of the worst things happening on Earth at any given time. And so it's systematically misleading about the state of the world because all of the a piece is just not a headline. So the fact, you know, when I grew, when you and I grew up, the consuming issue was the war in Vietnam. And if there was a, a headline, no war in Vietnam for 40 years, I mean, that would have been mind blowing. But of course, there's never such a headline, even though it's true. So the, the message was not be an optimist, see the glass is half full, uh, look on the bright side. The message was don't only look at the news, also look at the trends, which are more positive than you might think. But the data are what the data are, and you know sometimes they go in the wrong direction. One can then ask the question, what pushed, the, what pushed life expectancy up? What pushed war deaths down? What pushed extreme poverty down and child mortality and maternal mortality? And um, what led to the, what I consider a fact of progress? And then that raises the question, were those drivers, uh, are they now you know, obsolete? That right. is, for example, whatever succeeded in making wars less likely, do the wars in Ukraine and in uh, Gaza show that the we've gone back to an earlier stage of history and we can no longer expect that low level of uh, war deaths? So in the case of, uh, I'll just tell you what the latest data are. I try to track them. Uh, every year since the book has come out. So 2022 was a, a pretty bad year. The trend, I'll, I'll, again, I'll pantomime the trend. And uh, there's a definite um, kind of ski jump for 2022, half of which was due to the war in Ukraine, but the other half due to a war that people kind of forget, and that was the civil war in Ethiopia right. between the government and the Tigray re rebels, which killed as many people as the war in Ukraine, and which is killed, by the way, killed in that year 
five times as many people as have died in the Israel-Gaza conflict. Uh, so will the Israel-Gaza conflict uh, reverse this trend? And the answer is, is no. Uh, it is horrible beyond imagining. But one thing that you learn when you look at patterns of, of you know, just really horrible things that have happened in human history, as I was forced to do, uh, one of my reference sources was a book called The Great Big Book of Horrible Things, The Hundred Worst Things That Have Happened in Human History. And the author, who calls himself an atrocitologist, uh, had to point out in, in looking at patterns, and he said, you know, none of the worst wars in, in, in human history uh, involve the Jews as protagonists. Contrary to what a lot of people seem to think, Jews really are not responsible for the world's disasters. Right. And in fact, all of, you know, the Holocaust obviously is there, but all of the Israel-Arab wars since 1948 added together don't even make the top 100 list. So uh, there are uh, people who count wars, uh, talk about kind of small wars, medium-sized wars, large wars, and world wars. It seems horrible even to think that way or talk that way, but if you're looking at the span of world history, you have to. By those standards, the wars that Israel are involved in are, are all small wars. Uh, they're, they're not like you know, like the Iran Iraq War in the 1980s, which a lot of people have forgotten about, that killed well, maybe 800,000 people. Uh, the Vietnam War, maybe two to three million people. Uh, so this is, it, it is horrible. It keeps me up at night. But in terms of, is this changing the direction of world history over the last 70 years? Let's hope not. So far, no. Uh, of course, it would be surprising if Jews were responsible. <clears throat> for wars on a large scale, since there are so few Jews. Yes. Um, well, you would need a lot more Jews to have that scale of a war, no? Except for in the, the in the minds of the conspiracy theorists. So well, yes. We started okay, so this is a good opening to yes. anti-Semitism, which is, of course, what we all want to talk about. Um, and uh, and part of, part of what I think, um, I suspect when you said the conspiracy theorists, part of what distinguishes anti-Semitism from other forms of racism, hatred, prejudice is anti-Semitism is almost always a conspiracy mm -hmm. theory of one kind or another and has this strange paradox, which I don't know if you've ever thought of, that Jews are both subhuman and superhuman. They're vermin who control the world. And I want to just propose a theory to you, and I don't know whether you're familiar with it or what you think of it, um, if you are familiar, but there was an, a British scholar named Hyman Maccabee who said the reason he thinks that this strange inversion of subhuman, superhuman exists is that most hatreds see other people as subhuman, but Jews killed God. And to kill God, you have to be superhumanly bad. You can't be less than. And so there is a mythology in the mind of anti-Semites that in some ways Jews are supercharged. And this mythology, even though it originated in the idea that Jews killed God, has now sort of morphed into other forms so that Jews control the world and Jews run the banks and Jews are professors at Harvard. I mean, all the things that conspiracy theories <laughs> claim. Um, but I wonder if you if you find that that difference with other hatreds that anti-Semitism is different in that sense, and how? Yeah. So in looking at the um, you know, a, you know, a horrible but necessary subject of the psychology of, of genocide, there is there are genocides where the victims are treated at, are dehumanized, and you see a lot of metaphors of vermin and rats and dogs and, and you know roaches and so on and say the the uh, Rwanda genocide is in the 1990s perfect example there's a lot right. of that but there's and and um on the other hand there's a lot of mass murder and hatred that crucially does not dehumanize the victim because they're seen as evil and that is their wrong wrongdoing wrongdoers malefactors uh and you can't consider someone subhuman and judge them to have done, uh, sinned, to have co committed a great evil. Uh, and in fact, a lot of, when I reviewed all of these horrible things over human history, an awful lot of them were done um, out of moralistic motives. They weren't just done out of, uh, you know, kind of clearing inconvenient vermin from uh, a territory mm -hmm. that you want to conquer, but they're done as punishment. 
that they as as rectifying an injustice as as a kind of cosmic uh, ultimate comeuppance or or justice. And I think a lot of I think anti-Semitism has different um, strands. And and of course, Jews were dehumanized by the Nazis, but they were also seen as as you pointed out as um, as as evildoers. And to be an evildoer, you have to have the faculty of choice. You know, I, I think in looking at trying to make sense of anti-Semitism, one theory that I uh, found, find very interesting comes from the economist and um, ethnic historian Thomas Sowell, who wrote a provocative essay called Are Jews Generic? Um, asking the question, why, both why has there been such spectacular Jewish success in the professions, uh, economically, in culture, in art, and all the public realms, uh, and, and also such uh, murderous anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think if you're Jewish, you like to think about what is absolutely unique and uh, singular and almost cosmic about Jewish hatred. Right. And you know, obviously, eth every ethnic group is has a unique set of, of 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 traits and histories and so on. But Sol asked, is there are these the patterns that we see in in both the success of Jews and the hatred? Uh, do we see that in other groups? And he said there are commonalities in what he called middlemen minorities. So when you have ethnic minorities who specialize in economic middlemen niches, and he is an economist uh, in um, money lending, in uh, retail, uh, in um, professions where you don't actually make stuff, you don't farm, you don't uh, you, you, you don't manufacture, you're not a soldier, but you're doing something that every economist would say is absolutely essential to the development of wealth, namely making money liquid across time, bringing together disparate buyers and sellers. Uh, you know, it's really good that we don't have to go and buy eggs from a farmer out in the right. countryside, that we have a middleman who who, who uh, uh, brings them to, to um, markets. But if but the indispensability of middlemen to a modern economy, you just can't have a modern economy without, without lenders, without uh, retailers, is not intuitive. We evolved in societies with barter, you know, three chickens for one knife, uh, where there are tangible goods that exchange hands. And for someone uh, uh, who doesn't actually bring stuff into existence, but seems to be charging uh, interest or right. making a profit, it, intuitively it often feels like a form of, of theft or exploitation. And so the, a lot of the hatred f against Jews from uh, medieval times on, and continuing in the success in Jews in white collar and intellectual professions, it seems like ill-gotten gains. And he noted that though that the kind of um, hatred, genocidal hatred against Jews ha has been found in other ethnic groups who also have specialized in middlemen niches. The Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. also highly successful as uh, expatriates, notably in, in, in Boston, uh, but, but everywhere. Uh, the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, the Vietnamese boat people, the uh, often targets of uh, pogroms in countries like uh, Philippines and South Sea Islanders. The Indians in Uganda, famously expelled by uh, Idi Amin. The um, Korean grocers in American uh, inner cities. They're always kind of targeted <clears throat> as exploiters because they don't mix stuff, uh, even though they serve an indispensable function. And they also, these groups tend to develop traits that are necessary for success in the middlemen niche, including close-knit families, uh, literacy and numeracy, um, uh, an ethic of uh, delay of gratification and saving uh, for the future, which often makes them seem to outsiders as clannish and eth ethnocentric and gives them an identity because they all tend to be from close-knit communities that make them inviting targets, especially when we fall back on primitive intuitions as to where wealth and success comes from. I mean, I can see some, I, I certainly see a great deal of interest and justice to it. I can see some objections to it. Um, I don't know that it's so that important to anatomize it, among other things. Um, 
the hostility towards Jews is transcultural. So it's not only the people who operate in that niche in your own community. So in the Crusades, for example, a lot of the Jews of France were vintners and they were farmers and they were, but the Crusaders came down to Jerusalem and killed them along the way in Germany and in France and so on. But I, but I think there is, that this actually leads in some ways perfectly to the next topic, which is does religion supercharge such conflicts? And what we had originally, when we, when we first planned this, which was before October 7th, um, what we were going to talk about is, does religion have a future in the 21st century? And I think maybe the way that I would frame this to start that discussion is, do you think on balance, when you look around the world right now, religion is more a force for evil than for good? And here maybe we'll have our first disagreement. Yeah, you know, a lot depends on the, the religion. Um, you're probably on average more more harm than good. I, I would not go so far as your other debating right, right, yeah, no, right. is how religion poisons, poisons everything. Everything. Now, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that's really uh, yeah. hyperbolic. Yes. Uh, but in, certainly in the Middle East, if you were to subtract out the idea that um, there was some sort of divine mandate giving all of um, Judea and Samaria right to the Jews by a kind of divine right. And if you, even more significantly, if you were able to remove the um, uh, the the belief in martyrdom, in paradise, in the perfidy of the Jews going back to the, the Quran, if all of that kind of toxic mumbo jumbo were removed, you know, I think the world would be better off. Uh, and for a systematic reason, I mean, or a couple of systematic reasons. I mean, one of the, although religion can and does have many uh, beneficial effects, there there are some seeds of of um, uh, harm and toxicity. Certainly, the the idea of an afterlife, which sounds kind of hopeful and beneficent, but it means that you know your time on Earth, eh, it's just you know, you know seventy years or whatever infinitesimal sliver of eternity in paradise and so you know what's the big loss if you uh if you cut your your, your time on earth short by a few decades uh, but you get to go to paradise so that's that's and, and the criteria for what get you into paradise since you know they're kind of not obvious you don't open your eyes and see them you have to get them from dogma right. and that dogma can be you know any pernicious uh uh criteria like like killing the Jews. Hey, let me um, let me just jump in there to say that first of the first comment presupposes that there isn't an afterlife. That is, the idea that this being a sliver of the afterlife is a terrible idea is only true if there isn't one. Yes. I'm so a, I just want to point that out. If there is one, it's not such a terrible idea yeah. that this is a sliver of the afterlife. And also the criteria, I mean, look, in Judaism, the criteria is basically the balance of good deeds that gets you to whatever kind of afterlife there is. So your objection really isn't with the idea of an afterlife. Your objection with is with the toxicity of the criteria of certain traditional elements in certain religions. No? Yes. So that, that is absolutely right. Okay. okay. Um, and it's, uh, but it just the uh, possibility of appealing okay. to criteria for the afterlife opens the door to it being, you know, anything. It's just not obvious. Yeah, if you're Jew, it's this. If you're a devout uh, Muslim, it's that. And the thing is that it's uh, it, it it can be anything that the right. scriptural dogma says it is, and that kind of opens the door to, I think, some. some is it not possible to do the same thing with life in this world? Can't you say? that someone who doesn't believe that there's an afterlife still thinks that the best kind of life that you could live in this world is a life where you exercise power. I mean, the Nazis, I don't know, necessarily believed in an afterlife, but they wanted a Reich that would last thousands of years, and the way to do it was to live this kind of life here in the world. So I'm not convinced that the afterlife biases towards negativity. So yeah, I think it does open the door to, um, to, to, to notions. It, it adds a whole set of, I would say, imaginary incentives, which can't be a good thing. We know that people's time on Earth is time that they have on Earth. Right. Uh, there you don't have to have a leap of faith. You don't have to believe in what's in, in Scripture. And people live their lives. They have children. They have their pleasures, their joys, their, their knowledge. That is indisputable. And if you want to maximize that, 
then there's, I would say, less scope for, for mischief. Okay. Now, it is true that there are other uh, transcendent values, right. like the thousand-year wrath, that can also do mischief. Well, I was also going to say, uh, on the other hand, if you are convinced that there's no life after this, and you're not going to face consequences or judgment, that also opens the possibility that you'll act like a thorough scoundrel, not worrying that afterwards you're going to have to come before, you know, the big judge, as Alan Payton has it. Alan Payton has this great phrase in one of his novels, okay? This is just, this is an aside, but it's really worth it. Um, it's not Cry the Beloved Country. I can't remember the name of the novel. He says, um, this guy says, I'm afraid I'm going to come before the big judge, and he's going to say, where are your wounds? And I'm going to say, I don't have any. And he'll say to me, was there nothing worth fighting for? And I always thought that was such a beautiful passage. And that conception of an afterlife actually would make one more moral as opposed to less. Well, I'm reminded of Bertrand Russell's answer to the question. I think I yeah. gave it on the BBC. <laughs> uh, what would uh, Another famous atheist, not, not, not Jewish, uh, oh, yeah. put it mildly. Um, <laughs> said, what will you do if you, uh, you're at the end, you, you die and you face the Almighty at the pearly gates? And he said, uh, Russell said, I would say, oh, Lord, why did you not give me more evidence? Uh, but the uh, I, so the thing is, if you don't believe in an afterlife, why aren't you a you know an amoral, vicious psychopath? Well, you are. I mean, maybe if you were, if you were uh, uh, born without any kind of conscience or empathy, and the only thing keeping you in line was fear of consequences in an afterlife, you would need that. But most of us, having evolved as social beings, you know, do have a conscience. Moreover, we live in a Society where there, you know, there are a lot of little judges. You know, there, there, you know, if you if you commit a murder, there are police who will take you away in handcuffs, and a judge will send you to prison. Uh, for those people whose conscience isn't enough, there are moral norms of what uh, allows you to be respected within your community of people that you want to live among. So it's true that if you were an all-powerful amoral psychopath, or maybe there'd be you know, galactic overlord where you didn't have to worry about anyone ever, and you'd always be alpha overlord, uh, then you could act with impunity if that was your proclivity in the first place. But for everyone else, you really do have to worry about other people. But let me just also just give the other half of the, my, the answer to your question of whether uh, religion is a, is a, a source of um, uh, strife of peaceful cooperation. There's another danger in religion. And again, I'm not going to say this is true of all religions, because religions, at least in the West, have all liberalized. Um, there, mm -hmm. we, we have Reform Judaism and Humanistic Judaism, and uh, um, Catholicism had its ecumenical council, and uh, Protestant sects have become more more um, uh, liberal and universalist. So it's not all religion, but there is a problem of, uh, I think, fundamentalist and uh, hardline religions, and that is that they have sacred values, things that you can, may not compromise on. Now, that's a problem in resolving a conflict, because if you're if all you're fighting over is land in the sense of real estate, well, you could you know you divide it in half or 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 water uh, or, or 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 minerals. Uh, they are divisible. But if it's a sacred value, then you may not compromise at, uh, on pain of betraying your people, your creed. And there is research by the anthropologist Scott Atran that um, when it comes in, and in fact, done with respect to the antagonists in the Middle East, that uh, when it comes to things like in, on the, the Palestinian side, the right of return on uh, among Jewish settlers, the um, uh, 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 possession of, of Judea and, and Samaria, um, they consider it not something that you may compromise over. And in fact, if you try to sweeten a peace deal with you know, billions of dollars of aid from the European Union, that makes them even more adamant rejecting it, because if they could be uh, amenable to financial <clears throat> compensation, right. they'd be, you know, whores or, you know, quizzlings or, or um, betrayers of values. I, I, I appreciate the theory that that is true. A couple of things that, that we ought to be aware of about that is that almost every religious tradition has mechanisms for circumventing the things that prove to be too difficult or too dangerous or so on. And I'm sure 
that that's true here as well. Otherwise, you would not have peace with Jordan. You wouldn't have peace with Egypt. You wouldn't have. So it, it, in theory, that's true. But the other, the other side of this also is that um, I think that there is probably nobody here that doesn't think that some sacred values are really sacred. It just depends which sacred values. I mean, I, when King said, if you have nothing that you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live, was he being a crazy fanatic or was he being a civil rights icon? So the idea that there are sacred values when there are sacred values you don't like, I totally agree with. I don't like the sacred values of the people whose sacred values I dislike. But the sacred values of people whose sacred values I like, I think, are terrific. Um, and, and I suspect that you have things that you would say are worth dying for as well, which I don't know how you distinguish that so much from a sacred value. Well, it would be, uh, yeah, I don't know if it would be a sacred value. It would be a, a, you know, a trade off that under some circumstances I'd be, willing would to be make, willing. I'd be willing to sacrifice my life to save the lives of my loved ones. But by the way, this is Bertrand Russell. To go back to Bertrand Russell, this was exactly when they asked him, is there something that he would die for? He said, of course not. After all, I may be mistaken. <laughs> right, which is a funny line, but it doesn't inspire a lot of respect for moral character if he really meant it. Right, if there was nothing that he'd be willing to die for. Yeah, well, I think there would, but it wouldn't. I don't know if it would be for some value that may not be breached, uh, so much as it would be for the the the, the trade off, other people's lives as opposed to my life. Uh, and you know, we do, we you know, human life is sacred. But on the other hand, uh, we do believe that some wars are just wars, knowing that right. people are going to be killed. We right. make compromises in public safety. We don't spend infinite amounts of money on you know, highway overpasses, knowing that saving uh, money by foregoing a highway overpass will mean statistically there'll be some deaths in the future. Right. So I think we, we and this is an, a, 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 an interesting feature of human psychology, that we can, as you say, that, that, a lot of religions, particularly ones that have a rabbinical tradition, yeah. uh, where you can, in practice, question the sacred values by, you know, a little, little We believe little, in overpasses, basically, it, yes. Yes, um, <laughs> but uh, you can have the mindset of uh, you may never compromise, and then when you're kind of forced to it, you can often think of workarounds. So this is, again, you've led me exactly where we want to go. Um, very skillful, uh, which is human psychology and how it is that people, um, I, I want to ask both about mob psychology, that is how people manage to do, let me take a step back, like, I don't believe that everybody who carried out that Hamas massacre started out as a horrible human being who then carried out a massacre any more than I believe that every Nazi started out as a horrible human being. And then all you had to do was bring them to the camp and you had a pre-made Nazi. So, um, and, and I'm going to downscale this in a minute very much to ask you about illiberalism in general and, and the illiberal mindset that seems to be part of our political culture and so on. But I want to start at the highest pitch of this illiberalism and ask you what it is that enables human beings who otherwise would be, you know, shopkeepers and merchants and, and I don't know, uh, potato growers to become monsters who do horrible things to other people with either glee or without a, or without a qualm. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, a fascinating question and probably has more than one answer because there are multiple ways in which people can commit violence. Right. There's a kind of violence that people commit as long as it fits with the norms of being a decent person in their society. And it's often been pointed out that you know, it's unlikely that every slaveholder was an evil psychopath. Right. In fact, we know they weren't because some of them were actually in the rest of their lives perfectly fine people. You know, George Washington. Uh, but that's just what people did. And it, it has also been pointed out as a way of kind of shaking us out of our own moral complacency, that it's conceivable that our descendants will look back on people who eat meat from factory farms yes. as being you know, unconscionable. I, I think for those of us who are not vegans just don't think too much about it. It's like, well, no one 
thinks I'm a, a murderer if I eat a chicken sandwich. Yeah, and so you know, I don't think of myself as a murderer. As a vegetarian, I want I wanted to share with you. Jonathan Safran Foer has a wonderful line in his book Eating Animals. Um, he says, "You can't wake someone up when they're pretending to be asleep." Yeah. So you know when you eat meat, you know what you're really doing, but you don't want to know, so you pretend to be asleep, which is not exactly the same as you're describing, but it is true. Interesting. So, yeah. so I think there's there's that. There are the norms in a uh, um, in a given culture. I mean, it's almost it's we kind of related to um, uh, you know Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil, which mm -hmm. turns out did not apply to Eichmann. Uh, it, right. Uh, he actually was a uh, uh, ideological uh, z z zealot uh, and a vicious anti-Semite, but the concept has some psychological uh, validity. We know that from some of the classic demonstrations in intro psych that I teach my students every year, such as the ex famous experiment by Stanley Milgram, right. in which people uh, thought they were delivering lethal shocks to an innocent uh, fellow volunteer, uh, just by the pressure of the social situation, just getting along and doing what seemed natural uh, at the moment. There, there are also um, far more uh, you know, vicious and sadistic forms of, um, of, of of aggression and murder that people are capable of in the in the moment. In a in a, in a phenomenon, some some is called forward panic, uh, which I think more is rampage that there is a phenomenon, a recurring phenomenon, that when uh, people are in a state of fearful apprehension for an extended period of time, where they are uh, afraid for their own lives, suddenly they have an opportunity uh, where the people they fear are exposed and vulnerable. Then there's a, a, a primitive, almost a reflex, where people can just explode in murderous fury mm. uh, and just fall on on the the victim or victims. And a lot of um, atrocities and massacres and pogroms uh, are have this some, sometimes called a mob psychology, where the release from fear leads to a, a rebound of ugly uh, aggression. The Rodney King video is an example of those uh, of something that you, people often saw in real time from right. the, the video, um, and that's an, a second phenomenon of uh, that takes place over the span of, of seconds or minutes. So, um, as I said, I want to descale it from the from the explanation of terrible mob psychology to um, there has been, I think, without question, in the last. I don't know, 20 years, maybe a little bit less, um, an increasing, not just I, polarization is not really an adequate word. There's been an increasing viciousness of rhetoric. When I was young, if you asked someone, would you be okay with your child marrying somebody of another race? Most people would say no. But if you ask them, would you be okay with your child marrying somebody of another political party? Most people would say yes. Now it's exactly reversed. Most people will say another race, sure. Another political party, no way. Which, by the way, is both a, it's both an encouraging and a discouraging statistic. In some in some ways, it's very good, but in other ways, it it shows that the discourse has not only gotten more polarized, but our conception of people who think differently than we do has been. Um, our conception has been almost weaponized, so that we think of them as evil as opposed to mistaken, and their difference from us much greater than it was when I was young. And certainly the college campus is a almost like a laboratory of this um, phenomenon. And I know that you have uh, both written and spoken about it and even organized about it. So I don't expect a monocausal explanation why questions are always overdetermined. There's always like lots of reasons why. But give us a good reason or two why this has happened. Yeah, why has it happened in this uh, in this direction? And and, you know, and as you point out, paradoxically, there is massively more tolerance in some dimensions, right. you know, such as race and sexual orientation. Yeah, where uh, you know, in our lifetimes, there's been a revolution. Huge, how huge. Uh, you know, gay people are are treated. Um, uh, but at the same time, the political polarization has increased, and it is. 
um, pernicious and uh, it leads to um, easily documentable defects in reasoning, sometimes called the my side bias. That is, you uh, direct your reasoning abilities to whatever conclusion makes your side look good and the other side look stupid and evil, where your side could be religion or political party or hockey team or uh, ethnicity. Uh, By the way, this side of the room. <laughs> yes, it's fine. Uh, and and uh, another classic uh, right. experiment. Experiment is exactly like a yeah, classic right. experiment in psychology called minimal groups going back to the 1960s is that if you divide people under some completely arbitrary pretext, yeah. do you like the paintings of Paul Clay better or the paintings of Vasily Kandinsky better? To not quite indistinguishable, but very, very similar yeah. abstract expressionists. And you divide people into different groups and tell them that they belong to these different groups. And then they will, each side will try to punish the other, to withhold benefits from the other, give higher evaluations to those, their fellow. What's wrong events. with us? What's wrong with us? And in, people will, uh, if you give them logic problems, uh, will... Uh, that are politically tinged, like affirmative action, like capital punishment, um, like uh, gun control. People will, including very intelligent people, will make statistical and logical blunders in order to affirm that a conclusion that is congenial right. to their political side is right. That, name, for example, that gun control reduces. Um, uh, gun violence. Mm -hmm. So even statistically sophisticated people presented with evidence, fake data, I mean, a hypothetical study that shows that, that gun control does not reduce gun violence, will look at those numbers and insist that that, uh, that they do, and vice versa, if you're opposed to, uh, to uh, if you're in favor of gun control. So it's, it's, it's a sad... So why does it happen now? Uh, so part, partly in college campuses, a lot of it has been uh, kind of intellectualized in terms of the ideology that there are um, oppressors and victims. And so people are, this is actually actively reinforced. And I think we're seeing that now in the kind of screwball idea that, um, that, that uh, in, in the Middle East, the Palestinians can be analogized to you know, to, to slaves, to sub-Saharan Africans, and the Israelis to Victorian colonists. I mean, historically, this is cockamamie. Right. But if you have a, uh, uh, if the way that you divide it is not Kandinsky fans and Clay fans, but rather um, uh, you know, colonizers and oppressors versus you know, marginalized victims, then you can follow. And colonizers them. cannot be victims. They cannot be. They, they can only be right. They can only, and they can only be perpetrators. Right. Yes. Um, a common answer is is social media, although I don't know if that's really uh, a big driver. In terms of the left right, the red state blue state divide, the the the, the, uh, um, the conservative uh, liberal, uh, there's been a lot of seg residential and social segregation that, to a greater and greater extent, people with college degrees live with interact with only people, other people who are college educated and those, um, and they tend to congregate in college towns and uh, gentrified urban areas. Right. People without a college degree in outer suburbs and rural areas. And the institutions that used to bring people together across the education and class lines, like the army in the age right. of the draft, like, um, uh, 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 church attendance and when people were more church going, right. like service organizations, uh, bowling leagues have uh, have weakened, leading people's main centers of affiliation to be people with the same educational and socio socioeconomic background, professional urban educated versus rural uh, small business and, and uh, farmers. Uh, and that sociological, socioeconomic gradient maps very closely to the political gradient. Donald Trump, for example, did not win any cities. Uh, and there was a, a blue to red gradient from cities to suburbs, to outer suburbs, to suburbs, to rural areas. Uh, and then when the, the only people you talk to and hang out with are people who have been 
kind of steeped in the same right. environment, I think that increases polarization. So bringing the loop all the way back to the beginning in anti-Semitism, the sort of the worm at the core, the fundamental problem is a certain distrust of the other. I mean, I, I used to say actually in these debates that if you think that people are basically good, then you should visit a playground. Because what happens when a new kid comes to the playground to the other kids go, oh, look, a new child. <laughs> Let us share our toys. No, they say, get the new kid, you know? And, and if you live only with one kind of person, then it's very easy to assume the other. Is, and this is why I've always made the case, and I wonder whether you think this is true, and I'd be curious whether you could tell me if you think this is true, that anti-Semitism will never reach the pitch in America that it has in other countries because the Jew was always the identified other. There were Russians and Jews. There were Germans and Jews. There were Frenchmen. There aren't Americans and Jews. There are lots of different groups in America. And in fact, the identified other in America primarily was Blacks, not Jews, right? That was the, the standout group that, that did not seem to be part of the mainstream culture that was not as true of Jews. And so there are shifting coalitions. And that's what I always believed about America and I hope that is still true. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to that. And then this is another uh, kind of historical, philosophical, intellectual uh, lesson that, uh, uh, that I got from, from Rebecca, is that the United States is really unusual in that it really was the, only na the first nation founded on, on Enlightenment principles. I mean, mm. quite literally, in that the framers and founders were part of the, they were kind of Enlightenment philosophes in, in right. their own way. And the articulated basis of the country was not as an ethnostate. The United States was consecrated not as uh, the embodiment or repository of the soul of right. such and such a, a people or religion, but it was articulated as we have there are uh, uh, inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of right. happiness. Governments are just instituted as a means to the end of satisfying those goals right. that must uh, derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Nothing about the American people, nothing about right. Protestantism. And so there's nothing that would uh, make a, a Jew any less of an American than any other ethnic group from the get-go. But, but I think that these are two sides of the same coin in a sense, which is that there isn't one group. Exactly. Right, right. that there isn't one group, so you don't have an identified other. Um, do you think that that still holds? Um, there, I, you know, I think it's. I, I think a lot of Enlightenment principles, uh, you know, which I champion, which I think have led to uh, uh, literally progress to great things. But I don't think they're psychologically intuitive. And I think it's very easy for us to fall back on tribalism, on my side bias, on clan, on a uh, strong leader. That comes naturally to us. The Enlightenment-derived principles of a liberal democracy mm -hmm. and a, a country founded as a social contract rather than an ethnic group occupying a territory, we have to be reminded as to why that's a good thing. We've got to think it through. We've got to kind of have the historical consciousness that that's a better way of running things than uh, the, the phantasm of an ethnically pure state. And people naturally backslide from it. It's much, and, and that's happened in this country uh, in the authoritarian populist movements that see pure America as some kind of rural ideal and want to vest power in a strong leader. We know who, who the most recent strong well, leader is, um, rather than as a, a kind of a president in the sense of presiding as being a temporary custodian. So, I, I, at least part of this, and I know we're we're rounding the bend here, um, but at least part of this is also got to be what you referred to earlier is you know, when you're in fear, you tend to have this herd mentality more. And I would say that one of the reasons why America has done better is because the most, the single, at least to me, the single most important fact about America is Canada, Mexico, ocean, ocean. Right. We have geographic. We have the, the ideal geographical. Um, it, it's, you know, in Los Angeles, uh, where I lived for many years, the ocean is called Pacific for a reason. Like it never attacked us. Um, and and that and that sense of security is almost unique in human history. 
right? If you look almost every, anywhere else, people have hostile enemies on their borders. And America, yeah, we had a, a skirmish with Mexico, and we had a skirmish with Canada. But really, it's remarkable how much that wasn't true. And so you would think populism would have less of a hold here, because we should have less fear. No? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh... Yes, and, and it's probably not a coincidence that the populist movements will tend to identify uh, a foreign enemy, even if there isn't really one um, that challenges us militarily. But a lot of the rhetoric is that there's an invasion on the southern border. And in fact, in a lot of hard right rhetoric, the uh, language of invasion and right. even parallels, bizarrely enough, between uh, the uh, Hamas in Gaza and people from Honduras and Mexico and El Salvador in uh, across the Mexican border, which have like nothing in common. Right. But the mental model of an invading uh, force very much animates, well, certainly Donald Trump with build, building a wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that you're right that populism thrives when there is a perception of a foreign enemy. Are you... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have some time uh, for Q&A, &A, and I just want to thank, thank uh, Stephen and, and David before we move to Q&A, and, and also to our sponsors for this evening, Judith and Neil Grand, who have been longtime long listeners to these programs. programs. Their, Their son, son um, Aaron, Aaron, is also a, a real beloved student, student here, graduated, graduated I think in 2018. So thank you to to Neil and to Judith. If we have some audience q and I'll pass the mic to start here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, so interesting. I wanted to ask, um, it appears how um, American Jews' success in America is largely, um, it can be attributed to our kind of affinity to our ability to succeed, succeed in this liberal environment, this liberalism environment, um, kind of in the wake of October 7th and with the rising polarization kind of, I think Jews are finding themselves in an interesting environment alongside these kind of new age liberalism ideals. Um, and so kind of how would y'all place the, like, the trend of Jewish America alongside the liberalism trends in America? Kind of where do we go from here? By, by by liberalism, do you mean kind of leftism, social justice, you know, intersectional, uh, so-called progressive? You know, I think there's, you know, as long as the idea was, as in classical liberalism and, you know, 60s liberalism, that the what counts is the rights of the individual, that prejudice and racism and bigotry and anti-Semitism are wrong because they prejudge an individual by uh, a stereotype of the group rather than on his or her merits, then I think Jews uh, thrived. Um, I think every, everyone thrives under that uh, uh, that mindset. But when it uh, is replaced by what's now called equity, in the sense that groups should have perquisites and privileges in proportion to their base rate in the population, that's not so good for the Jews. Right. Because when you do the math, Jews are kind of overrepresented in uh, kind of a lot of arenas of, of public life. And if your politics, if your mindset as it's happening in, in, in some leftist circles, though not in classic liberalism, right. then Jews are, are overrepresented. There are too many Jews. Too many Jews at Harvard, too many Jews in, in Wall Street, too many Jews in Hollywood, too many Jews in the New York Times. Uh, you know, and that's so that whole mindset of counting uh, representatives of different groups and defining justice as proportional representation compared to the base rates in the population is a is a dangerous development in the American left. It isn't the same as liberalism. In some ways, it's opposed right. to liberalism, but it's uh, it's not good for the Jews. Yeah, I think that there's no. I mean, we completely agree about this. The metaphor that I once used is if you want to get a lawn uniform, the only way to do it is with a lawnmower. You can't do it by nourishing 
the law. And, and the same thing is true if what you want is equity, if you want everybody to be the same, the only way to do it is to cut down people who are higher. You can't do it entirely by raising people who are lower because you'll still get an uneven result. And so the idea should be a quality of opportunity, but equality of result inevitably means that you have to deprive people who overachieve because they're no longer equal. And that's the antithesis of what the country used to, used to take pride in. And I also think that actually, it's really in some sense the antithesis even of people who of the ideology of people who spout it. I don't think that they really believe that everybody should end up in exactly the same place because it's not a rational belief that everybody should end up in the same place because in every field of endeavor that we care about, we always acknowledge differences, whether it's sports or you know medicine. If you really care that you want, you don't want, um, you want the most skilled person you can find. You don't want to watch the least skilled basketball team. You want to watch the most skilled basketball team and on and on and on. So I think that there's been a confusion of some people feel that there have been groups that have been so long deprived that the only way to raise them is by making sure that everybody gets the same result. But I, I have to believe that this is a fairly short lived idea in most people's minds because it's so not only counterintuitive, but illogical and, and bad for, and it is terrible for Jews. I mean, in my profession, Jews are way overrepresented. <laughs> and it's not fair. Uh, but, you know, it is, you're, you're right that it is, I mean, it's illogical if you, uh, in the sense that it's inconsistent, the, the idea of proportional group-wise representation right. is illogical if you believe in things like you know, merit and truth and objective reality. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, you know, either the patient dies on the operating table. Right, or don't. right. On the other hand, we have seen an assault both in theory, that in that this notion of equity comes from an academic mindset in which there is no such thing as objective truth. There are no scientific truths. It's right. just a pretext for power. And in which we have seen more and more policies that seem to uh, militate against uh, right. Uh, selection by merit, uh, education by talent. Uh, that has, been to, I guess, you got to give them some credits for some some degree. Of yes, well, and not only consistency, but also I I do want to say something about the justice of that side of belief that we've just been knocking down. And the justice of it is, there have been greater transparency in institutions that claimed objective truth so that we see that they didn't actually have the objective truth they claim. And by that, I mean, when you have uh, a religious institution where there's been widespread abuse and you have scientific journals where there's been fraud or sloppy vetting or so on, it leads people to say, oh, you people who have been claiming to be objective and clear and so on. There is no institution in America, not the judiciary, not the police, not politicians, not the clergy, where we haven't seen that, in fact, what people claim about the institution didn't turn out to be exactly true. And so um, Satra has this wonderful line. He says, like all dreamers, I confuse disillusion with truth. In other words, you think, ah, you see, they didn't claim to be true, so it's not true. And that's the small leap that we've made that is so, to me, tragic, is we should trust less in these institutions, but that doesn't mean these institutions are nothing. They actually are something, and they're something important. They're just not what they claimed they were. So, well, it's also by their own standards of truth right. and consistency. Yes. So, it's yeah. it's true that science has often <clears throat> claimed things to be true that aren't true, but it's because we actually believe that there is such a thing as That's truth that we can say that. that. Yeah. Well, and my question is primarily for you, but I'd be interested in both of your input. I want to return to your deicide hypothesis, that part of the, the genesis of anti-Semitism was revenge for the death of God or perceptions and consequence of that belief. And certainly that's just a plain observation in Catholic history. That's not a speculation, that's an observation. But I'm wondering if you can clarify, are you saying that that somehow infused into Muslim culture 
to infused, infused into Muslim culture to precipitate anti-Semitism there? And if so, okay. could you just point to some periods or pathways for how you see sure, that infusion absolutely. happening? So um, there has been, there is, so part of the problem with the Jewish-Christian relation throughout history is that Judaism and Christianity were the same, and it was a family fight. And family fights, as you, as I'm sure you know, are sometimes some of the meanest, right? And that would have been okay were it not enshrined then in a sacred book and it lasted forever, right? That was the real, I mean, I know this is a simple way of explaining it, but that was the real problem. Had nobody written the New Testament, they just had a fight and then they made up, it would have been okay. But wait, 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 I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Something of the same thing happened with Muhammad, although not exactly identical, which is Muhammad assumed that the Jews would convert, and then they didn't, and so it's in the Quran as well. So in the Quran also there are very negative comments about Jews that fueled some Muslim anti-Semitism. However, for most of history, Muslim anti-Semitism, while bad, was never as toxic as Christian anti-Semitism until the 20th century. And in the 20th century, as there were more, especially in the time of Nazism, when the mutual enemy was the British and Western culture more infiltrated um, first Ottoman culture. Remember, the British took over from where the Ottomans were and Christianity and Christian stereotypes and protocols of the elders of Zion, which was a Russian, Orthodox, right, um, uh, forgery that the Jews were taking over the world, all of those things began to infiltrate the Muslim world, such that now in Jordan, in hotel rooms, you can get copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So I would say that the, the DSI Christian, like, supercharging is really a function of the 20th century, but the seeds were there already because we rejected Muhammad, which is not quite the same as rejecting Jesus, but it still sort of paves the way for that possibility. So we are still the ones who didn't, that we're still the ones who said no. And, and as you know, people don't like people who say no to them, generally. Thank you very much. Small comment and then a question. Uh, in defense of Burton Russell, if I remember my Chumash right, didn't Moses say, Tain Liot, give me a sign? He, he, he wanted more, yes. more proof. Yes. Uh, but the question is this. Your observation was very good about America not saying, well, these people are not American. However, the effect of Israel and the, the uh, charge of dual loyalty may be stemming. So could you, you know, talk about how Israel and American Jewish reaction to Israel may have been stirring up or being an excuse to re revitalize the anti-Semitism. I mean, that's how Jews felt about it, right? Remember that, Jew, that, that we forget this now, but uh, early in the 1900s, Jews were by and large not Zionists because they wanted to prove the loyalty to the countries where they lived. Um, and that wasn't only true in America, it was true in a lot of places, it was true in, in even in France. So, um, and certainly in Eastern Europe. So, it yeah, it's uh, uh, we all have multiple fidelities in life. We we just do. There's no person who has fidelity to only one person, or I think there's virtually no one who has that. Like you have fidelities to different fidelities to brothers, to children, to parents, and so on. Um, but we don't like that when it comes to countries. We want people to have the same fidelity that we do. So yeah, there's a certain ambiguity in saying I, I, I'm an American, but I love this country, um, especially when someone else doesn't have another country that they love. But even given that, there are a lot of other groups with a lot of other kinds of problems in America. So I don't think Jews are unique in having, you know, and having group problems that, that make them stand out. You discussed this uh, mentality and this argument of oppressor and oppressed, colonizer, colonized, that's become so common on, on campuses as an argument. What have you found to be the most effective responses um, to that type of application of that thought to the ongoing conflict in Israel? What, what have you found to be, be useful responses in argument? Uh, 
So I, I can't say that I, from experience that I have persuaded people out of that mindset, and uh, you're not, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you're not. Everyone is persuadable of everything. So I think the question might be, you know, the diehards probably can't be persuaded, but you know, new babies are being born all the time, and they're not born, you know, postmodern intersectional of, of social justice warriors, and so one can hope that to can persuade the people who have not yet been persuaded. So certainly a lot of the, you know, just a, a lot of history, but not least the history of the area that was called Palestine, namely there never was a Palestinian state. Jews were there thousands of years ago, always had a presence. It was uh, colonized, if anything, by, by the, uh, well, by the, Arab, the Ottoman Empire and then the, uh, the whole history that we're all familiar with, but that not everyone is familiar with. Uh, the fact the fact that um, uh, that, that Jews were uh, almost ethnically cleansed from a dozen uh, Muslim minor majority countries in the late 40s and early 1950s. Um, the uh, so that the full historical picture can't hurt for those who aren't already committed. And the, the, the fact that the um, you know also the fact that so many of Virtually all contemporary Muslim majority countries are not democracies, that they are uh, far more misogynistic, far more homophobic in law. This is not a slur. This is just the, the law of the land in these countries. Uh, ma many facts like that that, that upset this, uh, would, what ought to be a rather fragile understanding in the world in the first place, because it is so contrary to historical and contemporary fact. So... The beginning of Stephen's comment reminded me that, that Hannah Arendt, who was invoked earlier, said in every generation, the world is invaded by barbarians and we call them children. And you, it's true, you have to civilize people too. So it's true that the, the idea that there are always new people coming into the world should give us all hope. Um, the other thing I would say is when you ask what arguments have you found successful, I would change the premise of the question and say what I have found most successful in the course of lots of years of listening to people is listening to people. And instead of approaching somebody with the mindset of, if I just give you, I mean, all the arguments that Stephen said are true. They're all true. And yet, as people are impenetrable often to arguments, unless you show them that you actually care about what they think and want to engage them in a dialogue. So I would say my first, my first impulse when somebody wants to discuss an issue is to actually listen and ask them why they believe what they believe and ask them as many whys as I can until I give them. Because uh, jo my friend Joseph Epstein said, Jews don't listen, they wait. And, <laughs> and if all you're doing is waiting, then you, there's no way to persuade someone, you know? I was just going to follow up on the last question. The the whole oppressor oppressed dichotomy um, and the settler colonial white or white adjacent Israelis um, oppressing the Palestinian people of color. It seems like that's really the essence of what's infused academia in the United States right now. And, and liberal culture in the United States, of which a lot of Jews um, you know, are sympathetic to or consider themselves liberal. I always considered myself a liberal thinker. They keep moving the goalposts. And I would like to hear from both of you, what, what are we going to do about this? It, it isn't merely looking back and saying, yes, we're all on land that the colonialists stole from someone else. All these crazy people on the, on the campuses, these kids, I don't think they know what they're marching about. They just think that someone told them a narrative that makes sense to them, and it's not fair for white people to oppress people of color. That's the American version of it. It doesn't apply to Israel, as you 
mentioned, Professor, but it is putrid and it is everywhere. What are so we gonna? I what are we gonna to, do about? I just, I just want to. Um, the caveat of it is when you say it's everywhere, it is very prevalent on elite campuses in America. But it is not true that it is everywhere on campus. It is not true that it's everywhere, even on elite campuses. Trust me, because um, I speak to a lot of students, and a lot of campuses don't have this narrative. And when you take polls, even though sympathy for Israel is certainly lower among younger people than it is among older people, it's still higher than it is for Palestinians, even among younger people. So this goes back to we always see the narratives of conflict and the narratives that don't have conflict we never see. So at least I can give you a certain amount of hope to say there are a lot of people out there who don't actually buy into that narrative, even though there are many and many influential people who do. And when you say, what are we going to do about it? The, the, I, at least part of the answer is, you know, all the things that we are seeking to do. But it is very difficult to change someone's belief about their a story that they think is true. The last thing I will say to give you hope before um, before Stephen actually tells you how we can change it um, <laughs> is is about about three weeks ago I was speaking at a synagogue and we were talking about this I mean because every discussion sooner or later gets to this and uh, this guy gets stands up and he says listen in the 60s I was a member of the SDS those of you who are too young to know what the SDS is they were the most radical of the most radical like they were the bomb throwing weathermen black panther um groupie like they were really really left they were as left as you could get he said and now that i'm older i'm really ashamed of the things that i thought and i said he said and don't assume that what someone says when they're 18 or 19 or 20 years old is necessarily going to be what they think when they're 25 or 30 or 50 or 80 and god knows i would not want to be judged by everything i said when I was 18, but thank God there was no social media. So you don't know what I said at 18. Um, and that's a problem. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll echo the, the first part of what David said in that there is, there are, there's a lot of diversity, shall we say, within within and among universities. So the, um, the hardcore you know, intersectional critical theory, social justice warfare, characterizes some departments far more than others right. uh, and far more in the humanities than in the sciences or engineering or economics, more in public health than in medicine, more in divinity than in- uh, Than anywhere. Than, than anywhere. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm they, sorry. They often tend to make, down. Or make the most noise in the um, administrators, in the at least in the past, by administrators, I mean, not just the diversity administrators and human resources and, and um, uh, mid-level administrators, but the deans and presidents have tended to uh, indulge them. Uh, they're often the most vocal and articulate people on campus. Uh, I think a lot of the university leaders are realizing that just making nice with the, these factions has um, led to some harmful consequences for the reputation of the university in the public at large and uh, and, and among donors. Uh, so there, even if it's just articulated at the top, that there remains a commitment to seeking objective truth, to historical fact, to not just demonizing and dichotomizing, that could kind of tamp down the uh, the, the impression that the most radical actions on campus speak for the whole university. And I think there is going to be a reaction as university leaders, not least our own, have found themselves in trouble by just kind of making nice to the uh, the, the, the radical factions on campus. We'll have to start drawing some lines and, and, and being uh, clearer as to what the university principles are. Good follow -up. I'm a student at the School of Public Health. I'm a degree. And I was subjected to a presentation by the Palestine Center for Health and Human Rights. It's not a student group. This is a Harvard-sponsored educational center at HSBH. It was the most hateful anti-Israel 
anti-American hatchet job. There was no research presented. They told about one eighth of the history of the formation of the state of Israel. And I don't know who's sponsoring this. Yeah. It, 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 it is. So I sent a letter to the dean and I got back, you know, some legalese about freedom of speech. And I said, well, this is not a freedom of speech issue. It's an issue of academic integrity and intellectual honesty. The whole premise mm -hmm. of their research is a lie. What is Harvard going to do about that? Yeah. Who's well, in charge? Yes, so I'm, uh, I do have a, a, a dog in that fight in that I'm one of the co-presidents and co-founders of the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard, um, uh, announced last April, so less, less than a year old. Uh, I, I do believe that the university administration should not be policing the content of speech at any academic events, short of obviously illegal, non-protected uh, speech. But I think opening up the campus to freer speech is going to push in directions that 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 uh, I think we would favor because a lot of the uh, takeover of universities by the critical theory intersectional mindset has been accompanied by um, pretty strong censorship, cancel culture, intimidation of people who would espouse liberal individualist values, uh, not least at the School of Public Health, where there have been some notorious uh, incidents of professors who are not on the hard left being uh, mobbed and shamed and, and threatened with dismissal. Uh, if professors and students uh, have a, an environment in which they can make their case, where free of fear of being canceled, then I think we'll have less of a takeover by the most extreme uh, uh, ideologies. Thank you for a beautiful speech. Just a really quick follow-up question. What gives you, both of you, hope today that rationality can prevail over hatred? How do we help or what do we help? What gives us hope? Okay. What gives you hope? Yeah. Ah. Um, well, as I said, I'm, I'm hopeful by nature. Uh, and, and I also think that, that that's been, generally speaking, the progress of humanity, which is there's a great deal more reason and rationality now than there was 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm sort of a teleologist. That is, I believe that humanity is going somewhere. I think that we not only come from somewhere, but that we're going somewhere. So I, because uh, I, I have uh, faith, I think that ultimately, um, human beings will end up in a good place. Although, as, uh, as Stephen was saying about the graph, that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of backsliding along the way. Yeah, I, I would tend to uh, share the, uh, I guess, a kind of long-term optimism. Although, as someone with a scientific mindset, I you know, kind of recoil from any kind of teleology for the for the for the world, for the universe, for humanity. But I do think there that if one drills a little deeper and asks, why has there have there been some historical trends that really do work in the direction of both rationality and universal human welfare? Why is it that slavery used to be universal and now it's not legal anywhere? Why is it that every ancient civilization had human sacrifice now and none do. Why is it that the overwhelming direction has been toward um, uh, uh, women's empowerment in, in uh, country after country, and there, uh, there, there aren't countries that take the vote away from, from women? They do see, why is it that capital punishment seems to be abolished by uh, country after country, state after state? Uh, homosexuality decriminalized in country after country it seems too mystical for me to say that there's teleology, but I think there is, one can discern a direction, what, what Theodore Parker called uh, the, the uh, arc of history bending toward justice. So why would it bend that way? So there are a couple of not so mystical uh, reasons. One of them is that there is rationality 
objectivity, truth have a built-in advantage. Um, captured by um, the, the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, who said, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. So the advantage of rationality is it's rational. Uh, the laws of logic are always true. And so you can delude yourself. You can try to delude uh, the world. But maybe I'll, you know, as Abraham Lincoln said, you can't fool all the people all the time. And in the long run, rationality has an, that advantage. Um, also, um, the there is something. Uh, this this goes back to again um, influenced by by uh, Rebecca's uh, studies of Spinoza, um, a you know, great Jewish thinker and, and heretic. Uh, once you are committed to reason, there is a directionality in terms of your notion of human rights um, and human welfare. Namely, on rational grounds, you can't claim that you're special just because you're you and other people aren't, at least not if you have to interact with them, which we increasingly do in a more right. globalized world. You kind of have to, you have no choice but to, um, in interacting with them, to uh, give some credit to their interests, their vantage point. And that's why, as, as the philosopher Peter Singer uh, put it, another great Jewish atheist, um, there is an expanding circle over uh, long run of history over centuries and, and millennia that would start out as a kernel of empathy that we're probably born with for our family, our clan, our our, our tribe. Uh, it does get pushed outward to historically to the nation, to other races. Singer argues it ought to be extended to all sentient beings, whether they're human or not. But that force propelled by the fact that you just can't maintain the parochial provincial view that you are special because you're you. That's logically incoherent. And even though psychologically, we still think that we're special because we're us, uh, to the extent that we do apply rationality, it's going to push outward against that tendency. Or to to put it to put it in terms, since we're in Hillel, as Rabbi Simcha Bunim put it, you should have two pieces of paper, one in each pocket. One says, for me, the world was created, and the other should say, I'm but dust and ashes. We have many more questions, though, but we're going to go to just sorry, one final question here for the evening. Thank you so much, and thank you both for being here. Um, when I came to Harvard, I thought that there would be opportunities like this abound everywhere I look, not, of course, at this level of prestige, but just different perspectives meeting to discuss. So zooming out a little bit from October 7th, um, you know, I tried to organize a debate like this at the education school where I'm a student um, of just regular people with different opinions. And that was struck down as someone on the education, um, you know, freedom committee can appreciate because everyone said it would be too harmful to hear the opinions. So it's best we just don't discuss it. So, you know, speaking of things that are bad for Jews, if we're unable to have minority opinions, Where's the fabric of our whole religion go? It's predicated on having unpopular opinions. So how do we um, foster now that the rhetoric has been turned up from if, if you have a wrong opinion, you're a social pariah, to if you have a wrong opinion, maybe you're a genocidal sociopath or things of that nature to, to keep things like this happening in the university space where it's meant to and to get people to engage, not to not have disparate opinions, but to have to the gentleman's point, the extreme opinion that they're going to have, to have it in the same room. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree that the notion that ideas that you disagree with uh, may be repressed because they cause harm or hurt is one of the worst ideas that has emerged in the modern, modern university. And it's only even uh, kind of thinkable or conceivable if you don't have a notion of objective truth, of veritas, as our seals uh, proclaim. Uh, if you believe that there are, that some beliefs are true and some beliefs are false, then the fact that they um, make you feel bad is kind of irrelevant. Uh, sometimes the truth hurts. If you don't believe there's such a thing as truth, then it makes sense to evaluate ideas in terms of how good or bad, bad they make people feel. So just the renewing our commitment to veritas, to objectivity, to truth, to logic means that you pull the rug out from under the idea that you can repress uh, ideas or speech because they make some people feel bad. I, and as you said, th this really goes to the heart of the Jewish tradition. The reason that Talmud preserves minority opinions, even though the law isn't according to the minority opinion, is first of all because 
that may change. You may discover not everybody in this room believes what they always believed. So you may change your own mind, never mind changing someone else's mind. And the most famous uh, example of this in Talmudic literature is that Hillel and Shammai always argued and both, according to the Talmud, are words of the living God. So the idea that, that the world can't contain a multiplicity of truths and that each of us should have the intellectual humility to know that we only have a small piece of it, um, that seems to me to be the beginning of education. The beginning of education has to be a recognition of your own ignorance, and that means you have to be willing to listen to other people who might help you fill in little bits of that ignorance so that I'm wiser than I was 15 years ago, and 15 years from now, I'll really be ready for him. Uh, David, Stephen, thank you so much for enlightening us this evening. We'll do it again in 15 years, if not sooner. Uh, thank you all so much for joining here in person, for those online, and have a wonderful evening. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you did that. I've, I've carried these out for me. Yes, it is. All right. Thanks so much.